Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to podcast episode number 65. The podcast is now old enough to get Medicare. We have a question from Reese. I have a question regarding glute activation during squats and deadlifts. Uh, the fact you say glute activation, that's kind of a newer thing. Uh, when I was coming up, no one ever had a problem with activating anything. But I understand it, and I'm going to tell you the truth, I think there's value to it. Uh, when I had my left hip uh, go necrotic, I lost my ability to squeeze my left butt cheek. I couldn't make a muscle with my left butt cheek. I had what Stu McGill and others call gluteal amnesia. And I had to retrain my butt. You know, they, the first surgery I had, they fillet the glute and then sew it back together. I had to teach myself how to flex the butt cheek. Um, I think I had a good excuse uh, for that, and a lot of people I know don't. So let's get going. I have started doing front squats and deadlifts recently after making the plunge and buying an Olympic barbell and weight for the house. Good idea. What I have noticed, however, especially when heavy, my left leg glute doesn't seem to be activating or pushing as much as the right. I believe there is a weakness there. Are there any exercises I could do to help strengthen this up? Is there anything I can do to force it to activate during the exercises? Well, the, the thing I've already showed you online I think is the best, but it's, uh, we call our glute workout. Hip thrust and clamshells, 15, 15, 15 hip thrust, 15 clamshells, 14 hip thrust, 14 clamshells. If that doesn't wake your butt up, I, I don't know what's going to wake it up. But I find that the hip thrust and the clamshell do m marvels for this. Uh, when we jump up after the second round of that some days, whew, I know that my butt has been working. I would say that first. The second is, maybe you can't do it with a loaded barbell, but can you go through the movement and find where you think it's not happening and then consciously squeeze then or have someone take a stick and kind of whack it and just, you know, so you're, you're hitting something or if you're close enough to that person, have them put their hand on it and squeeze into it. Try that with just an isometric position, uh, maybe hold on to a doorknob or a suspension trainer, drop down, and when you get to the point where you don't think it's working, test there. Those, those might be the answers for you. The hip thrust clam shell, and then the active in the movement test. I hope that helps. We have a question from Chris. Chris asks, you often mention the value of pull-ups and hill sprints, and I think I have heard you say you wish you had done more of them in the past. Do you do them now? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the easy thing about living in Utah is it's easy to find hills. Uh, you'll notice if you go to my Instagram channel, uh, you'll see me doing a lot of walks up hills. Um, I do a lot of walks with mini bands around my socks. Uh, big, big fan of that. Um, the pull-up. Yeah, I do the pull-up. I, I program it in. It's not programmed right now because I'm doing a lot. I'm trying to do a lot more horizontal pulling right now but yeah there's some great value in it um, why do I think they're so valuable well it, it sounds weird but uh, if all you could do is hill sprints and pull-ups you'd you'd be okay those are those are two big programs I have a buddy who had been noticing for years that the kids who did pull-ups had the best sprint times and he kind of flipped the things around he said well let's see if increasing pull-ups can increase speed now this is kind of a one-off study, but it kind of worked. So I just think you got those two great full body movements. Um, I've never had a person get hurt sprinting up a hill ever. Uh, so it's safe, it's dynamic, it's self-regulating. You know, you, you slow down, you know, you know, I can't scream at you to keep going. I mean, you can keep going, but you slow. Uh, yeah, they're the best. I, I do wish I would have done more pull-ups early in my career. Uh, I kind of let them go after high school, and um, I think some of the imbalance issues I have in my throwing shoulder could have been helped with that. So, Chris, great question, and thank you. Okay, we have a question from Jeff. Um, Jeff's going to tell us who he is a little bit first. I have been a lifelong competitive athlete competing in swimming, wrestling, lacrosse, rugby, cycling, rock climbing, shooting for the past 12 years, kettlebells. God love the kettlebells. Always been in above average condition, sometimes great, never gone to pot. Uh, he's 6'1", 230 pounds. After demonstrating kettlebell swings to a buddy, he asked how many pull-ups can I do? I pridefully replied, it's interesting, two pull-up questions back to back, uh, none. 
so he, uh, can't do any pull, uh, pull-ups. He used to own the category back in school and during my rock climbing days 20 years ago. To the point, want to get back into them, but don't want to have my usual uh, issues and jump back in at full force. What's the smart man way for an old man to reacclimate to this program, to this movement? Uh, I would suggest that it's right there sitting there for you. Either my new book, Attempts, it's in the back, or go to the danjohnuniversity.com and go to the post-deployment program. And what I would suggest you do is simply the poll. For the first month, you hang. Uh, week one, you do one hang per workout, as long as you can. You try to go a li- up a little bit every time. Week two, you do two sets of hanging, straight arm. Week three is three, and week four is four sets. And you want to kind of slowly, generally build it up. Month two, the hangs are done like this or this, whatever whatever kind of pull-up you decide to do. Personally, I'd rather do this because I think it is better for uh, the history of throwing that I have. I think it's a little safer in the shoulder. I think. I could be completely wrong. And you'll do the same thing. Week one, one hold a day. Try to extend it. Week two, two. Week three, three. Week four, four. And then when you get to month three, I want you to hang for 30 seconds and do one pull-up. Hang for 30 seconds and do another. And I'd like to see you build up on that. Uh, for me, what I think on this is that, mm, Jeff, I, I'm getting a sense. You've got to be at least 40 or so. Um, if you push if you push that pull-up too much, you will get that MAPS, that middle-age pull-up syndrome that we talk about so much. But just try that idea. Just try the hangs for maybe just do it to two months and just see if that helps bring things around. Uh, one of the young men I work with, uh, he's in his 50s, uh, he has increased his pull-up, I mean, shockingly, by not having done pull-ups. He's built his hang up to, I think he said, 2 minutes and 45 seconds, his hang, his straight arm hang. And when he tested himself on pull-ups as a lark, he said he was throwing himself over the bar. The body will figure out how to do a pull-up, even if you just work on the two hangs. It's easier on the elbow, and you don't have any of those crappy reps that you know really can hurt you. Thank you. I appreciate that. We have a question from Andreas. I have a question about loaded carries on sand. I really like that idea. I was saying just the other day, I was talking to a, we were talking about a barefoot training. And I said, one of the great secrets I thought I had as a high school football player is we used to play football games on the sand all the time. And one of the things you learn in the sand, if the ball's up there, you, you can't reach, you have to, what we call it, don't be Frankenstein, see my arms are straight like this. And what it does, the sand teaches you, is to keep driving when you catch the ball. And because, you know, to get around uh, on the sand, you had to, especially where I grew up uh, in uh, the South San Francisco, so we had Montera and the Pacifica beaches. You know, some places were pretty deep sand. And the nice thing, too, is that you were exhausted, but you felt good. So I'm a big believer in sand training, if you haven't. Where I live, the best place to do them would be in the desert outback. Wow. Okay. Do you have any experience with this? Can it be considered safe to do? Well, I live in a desert too. And the thing we have to worry about here is the animals in the desert. Uh, is Yeah, as long as you, uh, yeah, as long as you don't get, I don't know where you're from, but as long as you don't get, you know, taken out by a rattlesnake or a coyote or something. Yeah, I think it's great. In fact, I think there's going to be a lot of value to it. If you can do it barefoot, too, occasionally, if you find a spot that's, you know, relatively clean, I think you find a lot of interesting things going on with your, I believe, I think you have three different arches in your foot. There's the one we all know about, there's this one, and there's a third one, and uh, who can forget uh, the third one, which I just did. But, you know, anytime you work on that load is going to make your, your arches spring back up. It'll be kind of fun to see how it goes. Let me know, okay? And send me a picture. We have a question. We have a question from another Chris. Seems with a lot of Chris's lately. Several friends and I are planning on doing Mass Made Simple as a group. Excellent. That's that's a good idea. Do you have any advice for me as the coach of the group? Anything we should watch out for as we go through the program? Um, you, you know, the, just make sure make sure people invest. If you're going to do it like this, Chris, I'd recommend 
do the seven week variation where you meet like on a Monday and Thursday and so that people can hammer it into their schedule. The other one, Chris, where you do, where you lift two to three times a week and you never really miss a day, uh, you're going to run into issues on Sundays and Saturdays and even Fridays with life. And it might be a good idea for you just to stretch it out the one extra week. Um, I would uh, try to do your best, you know, since everything is based on those big lifts, those big numbers, um, the 135, the 185, the 225, uh, try to get people who are in the same cohort to go together. I don't know how many people you're going to use, um, but I would not want you to get stalled anywhere. So if you could have someone like doing the bench press, you know, a couple guys doing the bench press, maybe some other people doing the, the bird dogs and the complex and the other stuff. But I would try to make the squat session, you know, every, everybody at, everybody kind of watches or is around. Maybe, I mean, if you have if you have like 10 guys, obviously that's going to take too long. But, you know, if you're three, four, five, everybody gets their chance to squat. I don't want to be the last person squatting, man. Woo, watching all that going. Uh, Chris, uh, your job is to let me know how all this all goes, okay? Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Conan, or Conan, depending. As a coach, what strategies do you use with athletes to keep them from worrying about not going hard enough while working out, especially in programs like Easy Strength? I was trained to always go to failure, and while Easy Strength has worked for me, I still sometimes feel depressed that I couldn't crush myself during the workout. Yeah, I mean, I'm all in favor of my opponents crushing themselves in training. I'm just... I think it's really a good thing because yeah, it tears you down, tears you apart, and, and you don't get that great leap when uh, you when you put everything together. Um, I think I have a certain uh, Conan. I think I have a certain. I personally have some gravitas when it comes to this. I have experience. I've done it. I make it work. I can I can show you the pitfalls of the programs. I can show you the the delightful highs. I think that helps a little bit selling the program. It is tough. It's tough to sell things to people because everybody wants to be one of those uh, sport nutrition drink commercials, you know. Uh, everyone's going to run the stairs and then, you know, we're going to high five each other and that's going to get rid of racism and sexism and all the other isms in this world. And um, it looks really good on paper, but honestly, um, quality repetitions are all far more important than crap. And that's a hard thing to get across. And any jackass can get you tired, man. Any any idiot can get you tired. I'm looking for you to get better. Ooh, that's good. Write that down. I think that's the key. Thanks for your question. We have another question from the Instagram live feed, and it's from uh, Justin, and I'm glad you got this in. Justin, I'm about to uh, run out of time. So let's just say he's just in time. <laughs> Okay, I can't seem to fix my squat. My knees always tend to cave in. Any suggestions? Yeah, my suggestion is simple. That's what the goblet squat was designed to do. You go down there and you push those elbows in the knees. Uh, that cleaned up a whole bunch of young athletes' crappy squatting where the knees come in. The other thing you can do now, and I like this a lot, um, is get a glute loop. Uh, I use Brett Contreras's, but Perform Better has them. Other companies have them. You put them on the outside of your knees. Okay, so just, well, maybe just a little bit above the knees. Okay, so here, here's the knee, just the, the meaty part, just ahead. And while you're doing them, consciously drive your knees out into the glute loop. Um, we do that in coaching all the time. Very often I just use my hand and, and uh, to isometrically hold a, an arm or leg or foot in place. Uh, it, it, it might not take you very long. Now, having said that, my knees used to come in on squatting because the only way I could stand up with my heavy cleans. Um, I don't know if that's universally the best idea, but you know, you, you, you try those two things: pushing the knees out, the goblet squat, getting a sense what the bottom position feels like, and then try the the loop around the knees trick. Okay, thank you. We have a question on my Instagram feed from Anthony. He says, "What skills distinguish?" the best coaches from every other coach. From my experience, from what I've seen, from what I've talked, uh, and just, 
just from pure knowledge, the best coaches seem to have this ability to take the fundamentals, the basics, and pound them down your throat. Uh, so, the, the, so the one side is this, the ability to do higher repetitions, lots and lots and lots and lots of reps with the, the fundamental things. In American football, block, tackle, ball control. Discus throw, you're going to throw the discus. And to stick with it and stick with it and stick with it and have the courage to continue to stick with it. Having said that, the other side that I've seen from great coaches is that they prepare their athletes for what I call special situations. Now, I'm best at this with American football because I know the game so well. But there's a play in American football that you might have to do once a season, once a career. It's called take a safety. You might practice that a few times and never use it. But if you don't, you can't just run on the field and say, take a safety. Uh, on, on my birthday, right at we'd been married about a year, uh, we lost a football game because, um, and, and, you know, all the, we, we did this kick and, on the kickoff, and we had a good plan for it, and it went wrong. And my wife got on us because she was up in the stands and everyone was complaining about how terrible of a coaching staff we were. And it hurt my feelings. And it was only a few years later that I realized, one not the kicker's fault? It's my fault. We had never practiced that kick before. So what you need to do is, as, so good coach focus on fundamentals, and then they focus on special situations. I train my athletes what to do if they have two fouls. How to throw if you have two fouls. And the, the last throw is make or break. Um, I teach my athletes to, we, we train in all kinds of conditions. Uh, in fact, uh, we probably train more in the snow than any uh, program I know. Because if it does snow at a big meet, we're going to be ready. Um, I'm always reminded about Dwight Stones, who, you know, but he was an American high jumper. And he guaranteed he'd get a gold medal at the 76 Olympics unless it rained. Well, it rained. The guy who won had been practicing in rain. So there you go. Uh, so two sides. An absolute mastery of the fundamentals. And the other side is understanding special situations. Oddly, if you do those two, two things well, almost everything else takes care of itself. We have a question from Sean. Sean says, I've been a strength coach for nearly 10 years. And after eight years of hard work, several certifications, and two books under my belt. Oh, and should I mention, my wife and I built a large separate structure for my business and our property. This was my dream for as long as I can remember. I find myself happy with the accomplishment, but the future is a little foggy. A little foggy. I don't know where to go from here. I pride myself on hammering the foundations of strength and addition and try to make it fun. The same thing I do. Eh? Effective and repeatable for those who train with me. I am... I am not a know-it-all, and I sincerely want to continue learning. However, I'm seeking a wee bit of guidance. The short, <laughs> the short version of my question is, now what? Well, you know, it's nice to see that you, you, you've put together your own facility, and uh, you've got the books, you're doing well. Um, this is one of those, this is one of those tough questions. I, I don't have that book from Harry Potter, Unfogging the Future, but it seems to me, Sean, that you, you're, you're already on the right path. Um, you know, I don't, I, I stopped doing things like uh, pure goal setting a long time ago, uh, outside of my athletics and physical stuff, uh, but business stuff, because, I mean, I remember making fun of the internet because I thought it was a joke because it was so damn slow. Uh, I was wrong about that. Uh, one of the things, Sean, I'm thinking is that there is rapid pace change in technology. And some of that's going to help us in the weight room. Some's going to hurt us. Mostly, I think, hurt us. But if you, know, if you decide to be one of those guys, like myself, I'm a, I feel I'm a historian of our field. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in love with uh, the old books, the old stuff. And that reflects in the way I coach people. They say I'm old school, and I go, "You don't even know, how, you don't even know what that means in my world." I mean, I'm old, old school. You know, I'm paleo strength. Ooh, write that down. Uh, gym membership, gym. Uh, 
it's a it's a good question and you have to ask that a lot to yourself now what but for me I've been noticing that there's been just so many accidental wonders in the last few years that I don't worry about uh, the, the future in my career as much as I used to because it just keeps as long as I stay true um, there's a great thing in Midnight in Paris where the Ernest Hemingway character as long as you're true and you're honest you know that will reflect in your writing uh, I think as long as you're true to whatever your North Star is your your foundational beliefs uh, your you know the, those those pillars those foundations uh, good things are gonna happen and it seems like good things are already happening for you um, wish I could give you a, a magic wand or you know crystal ball and tell you what's going on but I would I would stay true to your foundations stick with the basics and just let the future unfold because it's going to be amazing uh, just like uh, you know not just a few weeks ago my daughter said you know uh, that she's going to have a baby and you know here we go you know uh, here we go uh, you know uh, in just a few months I'll have another I'll have a little bundle of joy here and it's going to change me that child is going to change me I don't know how but it will I mean uh, with my grandson Danny you know he's reading Harry Potter by himself in the second grade the, you know and there's a lot of idioms and small words in there that are really difficult for him to figure out and watching him go through the struggle with that book you know just brings me back back to his mom watching her go through the struggle with that same book and uh, and yet in those blink of an eye what 20 whatever 20 years or so and just that blink of an eye, so much of my world has changed, and it's going to keep changing. So the thing I can tell you, uh, number one, Sean, uh, I mean, any woman uh, like your wife that helps you build your own uh, weight room, she's a keeper, man. So you're doing okay. Stay true. Have courage, and good luck. Ah, thankfully, Mike. We haven't had a question from a Mike in days, it seems. Mike says, I'm a 37-year-old deputy sheriff in a rural county in Michigan who's also a has-been Division Three football player. I dabbled in powerlifting and currently train in BJJ. I'm six foot two and about 230, 235 pounds. My lifts are as follows, squat 415, bench 310, deadlift 410. Hmm. Um, I've been using Jim Wendler's 531 and multiple variations of that for the past six or seven years. I know my days of hitting big PRs are behind me and my goals are simply to maintain the base of strength I have for work and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But even maintaining that base seems like an uphill battle. Sure. I also seem to be dealing with a lot more tweaks and nagging pains than ever than before. Any suggestion for some programming tweaks that I could add to build up my strength base? Yeah, you see Mike, this is why I think it's important to have a coach or, or, or something like the workout generator at Dan John University uh, it, you need it, to me it's you're it's screaming to me that you need some variation um, I use Nick Rain's uh, breakdowns for ages 16 to 35 36 to 55 and 56 plus you're in that second range and um, you need to spend quality time every year now <laughs> And it's strange for me to say this because, you know, I mean, I'm certainly no bodybuilder, but you need to do basic hypertrophy mixed with mobility work as um, for either six to 12 weeks or mixing it in weekly in an intelligent way. But uh, with your numbers, you see the thing about hypertrophy and done correctly is it doesn't just make you look good on the beach. It also moves the joints through, through a nice range of motion. It gives you a chance to heal up some of those injuries. And uh, I mean, it, it does wonders for your lean body mass. Um, your your numbers are fine. I mean, they're not, uh, they're not, you know, world class, but your, your strength levels are good. What I might suggest to you is find three numbers that mean something to you and say, okay, I got to be able to do this. Uh, the late Glenn Passy, he one time told me that clean and press 
clean and press his body weight, snatch his body weight, clean and jerk maybe 20 pounds more than his body weight. As long as he held on those numbers, he could be an international level thrower. And it's like, well, those, are, those aren't very big numbers, you know? But it worked. So it might be something you might want to do. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here, honestly. Uh, 315 squat, 225 bench. Um, a deadlift needs to come up. Um, 365 deadlift, okay? Those basic numbers. And what I'd like you to do is maybe take, uh, I don't know, 6 to 12 weeks of doing a general hypertrophy mobility program. Yeah, body build. And then come back at the end and go in and test those numbers without actually training those movements. You'd certainly do hinges and squats, but, you know, not training for heavy. And just see where your numbers are. And then you might want to say to myself, well, 225, I can bench that any day of the week. I mean, that's nothing. Well, good. So, or whatever the magic number is. If you can't bench that 225, how many workouts does it take you to get back at that easy lift? And what I'm thinking here, Mike, is that I'd like you to get your strength levels up. Okay, your strength levels are here now. And then do this hypertrophy bodybuilding stuff. Your strength numbers will probably come down a little bit. And that's just nervous. That's just the nervous system. It's not you. Don't take it personally. And then what I want to do is just by doing this general bodybuilding mobility stuff, uh, we're going to test these numbers. If you can't bench 225 the first day back, that would be concerning to me. But it takes you two workouts. Good. Okay, so it takes you two workouts to get back to your where your lowest end is. And then maybe if we do this again, the next time you bench 225 right out of the right after that six to twelve weeks of hypertrophy, then we know that you're really not losing strength. These, that probably that number is 225 might be a little low, uh, but so a number that you can you know you can get, but it's still heavy. That's the number I want you to start thinking about. And Mike, that would be the standard I want you to start thinking long term. And you want to stay as strong as you can with the least amount of work on it. Now you're noticing that you're having some problems with some injuries and stuff. Yeah, well you're doing BJJ and powerlifting, and you're. I'm guessing you're probably riding around a vehicle a lot. Um, that riding around, that desk work, and uh, the BJJ and powerlifting, those are all things that are going to you know, lead to some issues. And so I think any time you can spend doing some general hypertrophy, doing some general bodybuilding, is going to be a win-win. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Remember, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer every question, but don't forget, we have a massive archive up there now, so don't be afraid to look around for yourself. Uh, I don't mind answering good questions. Thanks again. We'll see you soon.